Hello, thank you for attending the lecture of Propulsion Systems for Microsatellite at Kibo Cube Academy. I am Hironori Sahara of Tokyo Metropolitan University and will I be the lecturer of this lecture. I have included a brief biography of myself. My current research interests are in innovative space systems, including propulsion system and system architectures as well as new applications of microsatellites. The contents of today's lecture is as follows. After explaining the basics of propulsion systems that satellite designers should know in chapter one, chapter two describes the bridge from orbit design to system design to make your mission possible. And chapter three gives examples of propulsion system design Chapter 4 describes laws, regulations, and guidelines that should be observed and kept in mind when dealing with propulsion systems. Chapter 5 shows an example of propulsion system module. Let's start with the basics of propulsion system. I would like satellite designers to understand the basics of propulsion system and not leave it to propulsion engineers. A propulsion system is an energy conversion device that converts uh, some energy source into temporary and spatially biased kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is used to change satellite's orbit and the attitude, and this is accomplished by a propulsion system. Propulsion systems can be divided into two main categories, uh, chemical propulsion and uh, non-chemical propulsion. Chemical propulsion is classified as liquid propulsion and uh, solid propulsion and so on, depending on the form of propellant stored. Electric propulsion is the representative of non-chemical propulsion at the practical level and is further classified according to the acceleration principle of propellant. Here are some indicators of propulsion system that satellite designers should be aware of. When it comes to propulsion systems, thrust and specific impulse are the first two important factors. Thrust is the amount of force exerted on the satellite. And the specific impulse is like fuel consumption, so to speak. Since thrust and specific impulse are opposing indices, no propulsion system yet exists that can achieve both as much thrust as chemical propulsion and as high a uh, specific impulse as electric propulsion. Therefore, there are limits to propulsion systems. Note that the acceleration on the horizontal axis and the effective exhaust velocity on the vertical axis are physically uh, quantities proportional to the thrust and specific impulse, respectively. Thrust density is related to uh, thruster size in the propulsion system, which affects the area occupied by the thruster relative to the satellite wall. Effective exhaust velocity is the specific impulse multiplied by the acceleration of gravity. It is further multiplied by the propellant mass flow rate to obtain the thrust. Characteristic exhaust velocity can be used to compare thrusters, especially in chemical propulsion. There are rather geeky indicators, but the thrust to weight ratio is important to satellite designers and uh, affects the propulsion system operating time required to complete a mission.
the total impulse required to complete the mission. And uh, the impulse speed, which is a measure of short injection, especially for attitude control, are also important. In addition, thrusters have an upper limit to the operating time within the guaranteed range, which is stated as continuous operating time in the catalog. The indicators on this page are particularly important in electric propulsion. Thrust to power ratio is related to a specification of the power supply. Conversely, the specification of power supply and the specified time to mission accomplishment will almost always determine which electric propulsion system is selected. The following is a brief description of chemical propulsion. Chemical propulsion uses a portion of the chemical energy manifested in chemical reaction, such as combustion and decomposition in propulsion. Therefore, the chemical substances and chemical reactions almost always determine the propulsive performance of the propulsion system. The most commonly used chemical propulsion is a liquid propulsion system in which the propellant is stored in liquid form. If a single propellant is used, it is called monopropellant. And if two types of propellant are used, it is called bipropellant. Of note are cold gas jet and register jet it uses the physical properties of the propellant. In particular, register jet uses electric energy, such as a heater, to change the physical properties of the propellant, so they may also be classified as electric propulsion, especially electrothermal acceleration type propulsion. A typical monopropellant is hydrogen. In particular, monomethyl hydrogen is currently the most widely used propellant, with a very wide range of thrust levels and almost the highest specific impulse among monopropellants. The most commonly used by propellant is a combination of monomethyl hydrogen and dinitrogen tetroxide. The thrust is quite high and is used as the main propulsion system for changing the orbit of a satellite that requires a large velocity increment. Next, let's look at electric propulsion. In principle, the higher the power of electric propulsion, the greater the thrust, but there is a practical upper limit. Although the thrust is generally very small, the specific impulse is 10 times or more than that of chemical propulsion. Therefore, it is a good candidate for deep space exploration and other applications where a long enough period of time is allowed before the mission is accomplished. Note, however, that the amount of power generated by the spacecraft decreases as it moves away from the Earth. Examples of typical electric propulsion for each acceleration type are shown below. When considering the thrust density and thrust to power ratio, the appropriate mission for each electric propulsion system is almost always determined. The DC arc jet is an electrothermal acceleration type electric propulsion in which propellant is energized by an arc discharge and the propellant is accelerated by a nozzle and injected. The specific impulse is low among electric propulsion systems, but its high thrust density makes it suitable for large orbit changes.
ion engine and the whole thruster are electrostatic acceleration type electric propulsion and achieve a specific impulse of more than 2,000 seconds. Although both have low thrust, the whole thruster has a thrust density about 10 times greater than that of an ion engine and is becoming the mainstay of all electric satellites. There is a difference of opinion as to whether whole thruster is an electrostatic or electromagnetic acceleration type, and this is sometimes a topic of heated debate. MPD arcjet and PPT are electromagnetic acceleration type electric propulsion. MPD arcjet, in particular, can achieve extremely high specific impulse, but it also requires a large amount of power. PPT is particularly suitable for microsatellites because it can be compacted by using a solid propellant such as Teflon and has a specific impulse of a few hundred to a thousand seconds with a small impulse peak. Vasimir is not intended for microsatellites, but is included for reference. Although Vasimir requires extremely high power, any combination of thrust and specific impulse can be achieved by separating the heated and uh, acceleration areas. This is my subjective opinion, but I believe that the Basimir is a good candidate for manned deep space exploration. Having a look at the various propulsion systems above, the question now becomes which propulsion system should we choose? First of all, we should decide between chemical and electric propulsion systems, taking their characteristics into consideration. If your satellite can provide sufficient power and the mission duration is long enough, electric propulsion with high specific impulse is very attractive. One important indicator for this is the thrust to power ratio mentioned earlier. If chemical propulsion is chosen, the next important question is which propellant to use. Hydrogen was certainly a good propellant, but it was often deemed inappropriate for use in microsatellites. That's why uh, low toxicity propellants are getting so much attention now. There are two major mainstreams shown as flow A and flow B respectively in this figure. Flow A is a propellant that maintains the equivalent specific impulse as hydrogen while improving ease of use, while uh, flow B improves on the initial good compatibility with microsatellites. In other words, flow A is intended to supply F1 car and luxury cars, while Flow B is intended to supply mini cars. However, Flow B is not a car at present, but a bicycle. The following is a brief description of the general way from orbit design to system design. To select a propulsion system, you must first determine the velocity increment required to accomplish your mission. Once the velocity increment has been calculated by the orbit designer, the propulsion system the engineer selects a propulsion system taking into account system requirements and system constraints. Here, the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation connects the, the orbit design with the system design. 
the rocket equation is derived in such a model and the resulting velocity increments are related to the specific impulse and the satellite weight, especially the propellant weight. Again, the rocket equation serves as a bridge between orbit design and system design by a velocity increment. For example, if the initial mass of the satellite is 50 kilograms and the propulsion system with a specific impulse of 200 seconds is used. A velocity increment of 435 meters per second can be obtained if the propellant mass is 10 kilograms. Alternatively, if the initial mass of the satellite is 50 kilograms and the required velocity increment is 200 meters per second, the required propellant is 4.85 kilograms using a propulsion system with a specific impulse of 200 seconds. In system design, the top-down approach from the mission tends to be the first priority. However, it should not be forgotten that the propulsion system also needs to make bottom-up requirements and constraints on the system design and coordinate them with each other. For example, uh, for absurd requirements to propulsion system such as a trip to Jupiter in three days or a required velocity increment of 10,000 meters per second, the propulsion engineer must loudly assert that it is physically impossible. Ideally, a project should have both an orbit designer and a propulsion system engineer. Very rarely, there will be someone who has both capabilities and experiences as orbit designer and propulsion engineer, as well as experiences in CANSAT or satellite development, and that person should be valued very highly. For example, although I won't go into details, it would be reassuring to have a propulsion engineer who can quickly make such a rough estimate. Let's consider some typical missions. The first mission is to inject the orbiter from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit. As system constraints, we set the initial orbit altitude, the maximum satellite weight, the upper limit of weight, volume, and the constant power consumption of the propulsion system like these. Assuming the Hohmann transfer, the orbit calculation indicates that the required velocity increment is about 4,000 meters per second. If this is obtained with a low toxicity propulsion system with a specific impulse of 250 seconds, the required propellant mass is 79.9 kilograms, which exceeds the constraint. Assuming a spiral transfer by a whole thruster with a specific impulse of 2,000 seconds, only 21.4 kilograms of propellant is required, which is within the constraints. We will try to design a system based on the judgment that electric propulsion seems to be a good choice. The propellant mass to be carried is 32 kilograms, uh, taking into account a margin of 1.5 times. Therefore, a propulsion system must be built with the remaining, remaining 18 kilograms. And let us assume that this is sufficient. If Krypton is the propellant of choice, 
the liquid crypto to be carried is 13.3 liters. Let's move on to the tank design. If a single tank is used, it will violate dimensional limitations. If the tank is divided into two, the height limit must be exceeded. Therefore, it is very hard to comply with the dimensional restriction. On the other hand, considering the electric power, the power that can be supplied to the propulsion system at any time is 50 watts. So the thrust is 0.3 mN based on the thrust to power ratio of whole thruster. Then, by a very rough estimate, the time required for orbital transfer would be 44 years, which is not feasible. Oh my gosh, the propulsion system can't meet the mission requirements. It is at times like this that propulsion engineers must assert their bottom-up approach to mission requirements and mission constraints. In other words, the propulsion engineers suggest that the system or mission cannot be established with these assumptions. Then it would be good to suggest what and how much mitigation should be done. One is to allow hydrogen-based propulsion system. Uh, however, this would not bring about a dramatic change. Or Instead of the transfer from a low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit, it is time to consider having the rocket inject the spacecraft into a geostationary transfer orbit and have the propulsion system take charge of only the perigee ascending maneuver. And we have finally found the solution. Now it remains to be seen if the project will have the courage and funds to accept it. Next, uh, let us consider on orbit phase control. Suppose that two satellites weighing 100 kilograms are injected at an altitude of 800 kilometers and that they must maintain a phase difference of 30 degrees from each other due to overlapping frequency bands. For this situation, consider a maneuver in which one satellite performs a phase adjustment of 30 degrees. One approach would be to transfer one satellite into an elliptical orbit with a smaller semi-major axis by de decelerating it at a certain point in its orbit. The difference in the orbital period is caused by the difference in the semi-major axis, and this allows the satellites to reach a predetermined phase difference after several revolutions. The required velocity increment depends on the time required to reach this phase difference, which is, in this case is set to seven days. The orbital period at an altitude of 800 kilometers is 6,052 seconds. To achieve a phase difference of 30 degrees in seven days, a phase difference of 4.96 over 100,000 degrees per second must occur, or 0.3 degrees per orbit. This is achieved by an orbit with an orbital period of 6,047 seconds and the semi-major axis of 7,174 kilometers. The velocity increment for deceleration required to reach the perigee altitude is two meters per second. Since it will return to its original orbit after seven days, this is multiplied by two to obtain the total required velocity increment.
The propulsion engineer takes over this velocity increment. Since the required velocity increment is small, a cold gas jet with a specific impulse of 80 seconds is selected here. The required gas mass is 500 grams. If nitrogen is chosen as the propellant, this is 17.9 mole or about 400,000 cubic centimeters in the normal state. If the tank is filled with this nitrogen at 10 atmospheres, the required tank volume is 40,000 cc. If a cylindrical tank with a diameter of 20 centimeters is used, the length of the tank would violate the dimensional limitation. If a single tank is employed, but this can be solved by dividing the tank into four. Of course, the higher the gas pressure, the smaller the tank volume becomes. But the tank becomes considerably heavier to ensure a margin of pressure resistance. Alternatively, the monopropellant mode of MFMP prop that I am developing can be employed to achieve a propulsion system with considerable margin. Finally, let's address the rendezvous problem. To find the required velocity increment in a rendezvous problem, it is very convenient to use Hill's equation. The details should be studied in the course of orbital mechanics but by using Hill's equation, it can be assumed that there is no external force immediately after the injection. And the velocity increment can be easily obtained from the exact solution. Here, we consider a chaser stationary at an altitude of 400 kilometers uh, in a circular orbit at a distance of one kilometer forward from the target, which meets the target in one third of the orbital period. Then the necessary velocity increments are delta V1 to start moving fast and delta V2 uh, to remain stationary at the target position. And the sum of these is 1.0 eight meters per second. The velocity increment depends on the time required to complete the rendezvous. And the shorter rendezvous time requires a larger velocity increment. Now, because propulsion systems handle chemicals and high pressure gases, it can have a significant impact on personnel and equipment, loads, regulations, and guidelines. They have strict provisions for ensuring safety. This section introduces them. Since propulsion systems handle chemicals, including toxic substances, high pressure gases, and pressure vessels, they must be developed and operated in accordance with various laws and regulations. It should be emphasized that each country has its own laws and regulations, and satellite developers, including propulsion engineers, need to thoroughly examine and understand them. However, some Japanese laws and regulations are mentioned in this chapter. Therefore, the audience should carefully check the laws and guidelines of your own countries and institutions. For example, Japan has both the High Pressure Gas Safety Act and the General High Pressure Gas Safety Regulations regarding high pressure gas. The poisonous and uh, deleterious substances control law is in place for the handling of poisonous and deleterious substances.
There are also various laws and regulations governing the transport, handling, and disposal of propellants. When launching from an overseas launch site, you must comply with the laws and regulations of the country concerned as well as your own national laws, international laws, and international standards. In order to find out what laws and regulations regulated the chemical substances you are about to handle, be sure to read the Material Safety Data Sheet, MSDS, carefully in advance. As I say many times, please read the MSDS carefully first. In addition to the laws and uh, regulations, uh, there are uh, other guidelines and systems that must be followed, all of which must be reviewed and understand. For example, filling propellant and pressure measurement at the launch site require the use of CE marked equipment in EU countries and the ATEX directive must be complied with if there is a possibility of an explosive atmosphere. Note that it is not sufficient to bring what you normally use in your laboratory. In addition, there are strict security regulations governing the purchase of propulsion system elements from overseas and the export of propulsion systems and satellites equipped with the propulsion system to other countries. In the case of Japan, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry has jurisdiction over these regulations as list control and catch-all control. U.S. security regulations include the Export Administration Regulations and the ITAR. For example, it must be understood as common sense that even if an American product can be purchased and imported to Japan, taking it to a third country launch site with a propulsion system or a satellite integrated into it, is re-exporting. Especially in the case of rocket-related and space-related research, amateur judgment is dangerous, and it is necessary to seek the judgment of an appropriate person. Also speaking as an example, if there is a standard product that can be imported and re-exported, but a slightly modified version is purchased, it may not be allowed it to be re-exported. Space agencies specify their own design standards and guidelines. Some of these are publicly available, so they should be carefully referred to and reflected in the design. For example, in the case of JAXA, uh, there is the JAXA Management Requirement, JMR, and uh, the JAXA Engineering Requirement, JERG. Not all of JMR and JERG are available to the public, but many of them are available also in English. The following are some of the guidelines we have used in the past when launching our propulsion system on satellites. Also note that, as stated in JMR003, avoidance of debris generation is currently a guideline, but it is expected to become an obligation or a law eventually. Note that these guidelines are frequently revised so be sure to apply the latest version. Please note that the application of an older version will not be accepted in the safety review. In addition, although stress, corrosion, cracking, and cumulative 
fatigue is used as an example, guidelines that have been very widely applied should be found and applied. For example, a subsystem will experience vibration test in three axes at the quality test level on its own, and will experience vibration test in three axes at the acquisition test level on board a satellite. So there is a high enough probability that it will enter the fatigue zone. Therefore, the evaluation of cumulative fatigue is essential. And for this purpose, uh, it is necessary to conduct sufficient tests on an engineering model with the same specifications as the flight model. Specific examples will be presented. The premise and the purchase and re-export of goods are summarized here again. As a concrete example, let us take propellant tanks. JERG0001 details the design, manufacture, and certification of high-pressure gas equipment, and based on this, consider providing the tanks yourself as your own. To have a home-built tank certificated, one has to go through a very large number of steps which are very difficult anyway. By the way, if you read section 2.2 .2 carefully, you will notice that there is an exemption to the rule. If the following items are prepared, the procedures and verifications necessary to be allowed to use a homemade tank can be omitted to a great extent. In view of the cost of development and testing, there is no reason not to apply such exemptions. The pressure is often defined as MEOP of the tank when a margin of typically 15 degrees is taken into account for the maximum temperature of the propulsion system expected at the loading position in the satellite. Or if the pressure increases during on-orbit storage, the MIOP is defined at the maximum pressure at the end of the satellite's life or during the debris avoidance period. The evidence should be demonstrated by physical properties and basic experiments. A means of verifying the pressure must also be defined. Then, in order to assume the aforementioned exemptions, the, the item listed in the guidelines should be followed, verified considering margin and worst case scenarios and summarized in a document for safety review. Strength calculations should be performed, including simulations using reliable tools and hand calculations for fundamental quantitative and qualitative understanding. Stress corrosion cracking should also be evaluated. For example, when aluminum alloys are used, the application of MSFC STD3029 defines the temper and operating environment according to its magnesium content. Then, the verification for exemptions is performed. First, on the left is a mill sheet. On the right is the pictures of the necessary inspections. This section defines the test items and schedule for conducting thermal vacuum test, mechanical environment test, storage test, injection test, etc. for each component of the propulsion system 
and for the propulsion system as a system that combines these components. If there are any omissions in the examination items here, there will be troublesome retest later on. So be sure to make this plan thoroughly. Hazard analysis is then performed and evaluated on two axes, frequency of occurrence and severity. If there are hazards that require special attention due to the unique characteristics of the subsystem, it is necessary to prepare a unique hazard report dealing the phenomena, their causes, control methods to avoid them and means to verify their avoidance, etc., for the safety review. Propulsion systems designed for use in microsatellites are now emerging. Some of them have already been modularized, and we encourage you to investigate them. Since it is impossible to introduce all of them here, we introduce a propulsion system module that we are researching and developing as an example. Low toxicity propulsion systems for microsatellites have already been supplied for both chemical and electric propulsion. These propulsion system module are plotted against their size and total impulse in these figures. The propellants are broadly classified into ADN-based, HAM-based, and highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide-based as the propellants in the flow A. On the other hand, we are developing MFMP prop, which is based on flow B, but has a performance that can be compared to a miniature car instead of a bicycle and some of them are space proved. These pictures show the MFMP prop module for microsatellites in the past. And two of these modules have actually traveled to space. Although in general, a propulsion system is regarded as an essential to mission accomplishment, we sometimes hear, oh, it's too big. Also, the large elements such as tanks and thin piping often make it difficult to ensure resistance to the mechanical environment. The solution to these problems is the real pleasure of propulsion engineers. And we also are developing MFMP prop to achieve the required performance while reducing the burden on the satellite. I will now summarize this lecture. In chapter one, we described the propulsion system and the important parameters that indicate propulsion performance. Chapter 2 describes the velocity increment and the rocket equation that bridge uh, orbit design and system design. In Chapter 3, examples of representative missions from orbit calculation to system design were briefly introduced. Chapter 4 describes laws, regulations, and guidelines related to the development and installation of prop propulsion system. In any case, amateur judgment should be avoided and the appropriate literature and the advice of the person in charge should always be followed. Chapter five provided an overview of low toxicity propulsion systems for microsatellites and introduced our MFMP prop as a concrete example. In the future, many missions that require a propulsion system are expected to appear, even for microsatellites. At that time, we hope that propulsion engineers 
orbit designers and system designers will operate and cooperate well with each other so that appropriate designs can be made and the mission can be carried out without fail. Thank you very much for taking this course.